entrepreneurship. You might have thought in the past, how do people get an idea to suddenly start their own company? And how do some companies succeed and other, uh, other companies might not succeed? And of course, you often think, how do these big brands will be created that suddenly have the right to work with the most attractive labels in the world? Today, I'm very proud that we have someone here who did all that at a very young age. His name is Joel Berkowitz. He's a young entrepreneur and he is not only doing something, he is doing soft toys with all major brands, you know, including TFL Transport for London. Hello and welcome, Joel Berkowitz. Hi, Niels. How are you? Very good. How are you doing? Yes, very good. Thank you. Excellent. So, of course, um, it, one thing, if, if I just can ask that, if, if it's okay for you just to give people a bit of context, how old are you, Joel? So, um, contrary to uh, popular belief, I'm actually 25, uh, although my height sometimes um, makes me perceived to be a little bit older. I'm, I'm six, <laughs> okay. six foot four, so... Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So 25 years old, you, you, you are dealing with major brands like TFL and other brands. You can talk about that in due course mm -hmm. of this interview. Um, producing soft toys is an international business. Often these are not produced locally because the, the skill, I think, isn't available anymore in, in many places today. How did you, let's, let's put first things first, how did you get the idea to start in this very competitive industry? Because let's face it, plush toys, soft toys exist and there are major global players on the market. How did you get the idea to say, that is something where I want to compete? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very good question. Um, there are um, many companies who are producing um, what we call teddy bears as such, which are characterized soft toys. Um, mm -hmm. And when it came to um, the concept that I had, um, it was not with the intention of starting a business the requirement in order to gain a license from my first, uh, my first license or which was Transport for London and London Underground required, mm -hmm. required an incorporated company uh, to obtain a license. So it kind of was a fate of accompli where I had to uh, take, uh, sorry, create a company in order to obtain that license and then move forward with uh, the, the development program and so forth. Okay, so when you start in this business, normally I would say it is not a business where you can start with no, no income or let's say no cash reserves because you have to put some money on the table to get started first. And also, I would wonder if, if you, at an age of probably, I don't know, 21, 22, if, if you call TFL, hello, I'm a young entrepreneur, um, would you give me the license to give me your global brand? Isn't the answer no? Well, well the answer... <laughs> <laughs> the answer originally was no. Um, so okay. I, was actually, I was actually 19 at the time, uh, studying uh, transport design. You called you call TFL at the age of 19 if you could do branded toys in their name. Yeah, they're like, who is this kid? Um, <laughs> okay. Go, go, please, please leave us alone. We don't, we don't know you. We want you to just leave us alone now. Uh, yeah. That was the vibe. Um, and I was like, okay, well, what can I do to make them change their stance? Um, mm -hmm. So I actually spent about nine months, um, as I mentioned, I was studying Coventry University uh, Transport Design, uh, and I spent the following nine months uh, trying to find uh, a factory online um, in the UK, firstly, um, but uh, we obviously ruled that out um, because, as you mentioned, the skill set in the UK is no longer present, so we had to take yeah. it to the Far East, um, and found uh, an incredible factory produced uh, a sample so I actually had something to show uh, mm -hmm. and took it, to, took it to TFL and at that point they thought that okay maybe this kid's onto something he's a little bit more serious about this and this it looks actually pretty cool uh, what are the options you know we have with it hmm so let's I I just put myself now in the position of being TFL Someone approaches me, I say no. They come back, so I think, okay, they are serious. And I like the product. Wouldn't I, as a major brand, which is known globally, tell you, okay, I expect this amount of money up front to work with you, to give you the generosity to be able to work with our brand? Isn't that what they do, that they charge you money up front and then you're able to use their branding, their license, their whatever you want to use? Yeah, absolutely. And then here's, here's one of the major values you get of a face-to-face meeting. So although I was young, because I had this great idea that they could capitalize on, 
they actually not only gave me the license in the end, but they gave it to me for free. So there was no upfront payment. And they thought, you know what, we're going to give this uh, guy a chance. Uh, he's got a great product. And they gave it to me for free. And I only paid 10% royalty on wholesale prices. So Why? Actually... Why? Sorry, sorry. I just have to. Sorry for interrupting you. Why does TFL give you a license for free? I think it must be my charm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you no. think if you had the whole meetings, if, if you had all these meetings only on the phone, you think they, they wouldn't have given you for free? A million percent not. Okay. Um, so, so building up this rapport, uh, at the time, I, I was fortunate. At the time, there was this uh, uh, lady, her name was Saskia, and we uh, built up this rapport. Remember, I went to her nine months previously. So over the, over the night, uh, following nine months, I was able to keep showing her the progress, showing her what we're up to, what we're doing. And she was the key decision maker. Um, and it was very much important to build up that rapport. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and, and you're working with them ever since. So that means when I, when, I, when I walk through London, see a soft toy somewhere in a souvenir store, your company produces that. Correct. It's, it's, uh, souvenir stores is actually not our main, uh, main outlet anymore. Main outlets mm -hmm. are places like uh, Harrods, uh, London, Eye, London Eye Shop. We're going to be launching in Hamleys. Uh, we, are, we sell a lot online. So there's a lot of uh, products that if you type into Google and you're looking for London gifts or London underground toys, we're generally within the first line of products that come up. So okay. interesting how, and, and that's actually had no money put into it to achieve that. It's kind of been very organic uh, in the way that, mm -hmm. that happens. And that's the benefit of using a brand, just to add, mm -hmm. the benefit of having a license and using a brand is that you are piggybacking on an already successful brand name. So you don't have to put as much into the marketing. So, so it kind of balances out what you would put into marketing for your own product, which we do do our own products, which are not licensed, is, is counterbalanced by paying them a license fee. So mm -hmm. you actually get the best of both worlds. Yeah. Where did you go from there? TFL, I think, is a pretty good point to start from. So you have a quite good reference in your pocket. Where did you go from there with other brands? So we launched the London Underground London Buses range at the National Exhibition Centre uh, Spring Fair in 2016. Uh, and mm -hmm. we were approached at the time uh, by my current business partner. He was uh, adjacent to me and uh, we met there and happened to live 10 minutes apart. And uh, we happened to, uh, his kids went to the same school that I went to. So it's, it's, it was a very interesting um, meet. And at the same time, we had uh, people approach us such as ITV, uh, Harrods was at that uh, occasion. Uh, and from that, we were able to develop a whole further range of uh, London themed products before expanding into other categories, uh, which I'm happy to go into if, uh, if, that's, uh, if, if you'd like me to. Um, but, yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, okay, great. <laughs> so, so, so from that, you might uh, know of Thunderbirds. Uh, so ITV uh, came to us uh, and we had a London Underground themed, giant London Underground station themed exhibition stand. So it attracted a lot of attention. And they came to us saying, we're looking for a partner to produce plush toys for the new uh, Thunderbird series that ITV are producing in CGI. Uh, mm -hmm. and that was a very interesting uh, process. We learned, I learned a lot about uh, licensing industry, which is not so much uh, a, a, a transport brand. It was more of a character brand. Uh, that was a new yeah. experience for me. So it was interesting going to their offices, looking through their assets, working with the Thunderbird characters. And we produced, uh, we produced uh, an amazing range uh, of all the Thunderbird craft. And, that, and from that, again, it snowballed into other kind of uh, avenues where we've got a license with JCB, which I'm sure you're familiar with, to produce yeah. construction toys. That's become of one of our best, our best sellers, the backhoe digger. And then we, uh, we, we were very, very lucky to stumble upon an opportunity with uh, a, a company working with Warner Brothers on the Harry Potter toy series. And their expertise did not lie in plush toys. And we okay. produced a series of uh, plush toys based on the Harry Potter franchise. And mm -hmm. we ended up partnering with them to produce oh. plush toys. Excellent. Is, yes, yes. Congratulations. Thank you. So, um, um, of course, you don't have to mention brands with the next question I have now, because, of course, I will ask, is it a straightforward success from TFL and every other brand you had? 
was just selling, selling, selling. So it was all success from A to Z, from soup to nuts. Or were there moments where you say these were setbacks, challenges, problems we, we faced on the way there? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's not plain sailing at all. You go into a license with the understanding that there is a certain level of risk, uh, but it's calculated mm-hmm. risk. You try and manage that risk by ensuring you've got the full facts about the brand you're working with prior to going into it. Sometimes that's mm-hmm. not always possible. An example of that was with Thunderbirds. So when we launched the company and ITV come to us and it's like, wow, ITV, Thunderbirds, this is incredible. This is the golden ticket. It yeah. actually turned out to be an expense for the business to pay them off because oh. the, brand, the brand never took off uh, as, as, as much as it needed to. Um, but the experience that I learned from that was totally invaluable to the future of this particular business. So I don't mm-hmm. regret that whatsoever. Excellent. So when we have people now who, who, who think about setting, their, setting up their own business, let's mm-hmm. face it, most people, when you have a big idea, will tell you it's not going to work. People are in this place already. Competitors are going to crush you. So what would be your advice to them when they have a business idea? Because it's, um, especially today, when you look in the, into the motivational or inspirational speaking world, most of the advice you find is just get started. You're going to figure out on the way. If you're yeah. in the right moment and you're dedicated, work hard, you, you will succeed. And when we look into results, that definitely is not the case. So what, what would you say is proper advice for people who think about setting up their own business? Absolutely. So, so this whole motivation thing is a totally separate area to actually the practical side of, of starting and running a business. So from my experience so far, the marketplace is very crowded. There is everything you could want is out there. Most new ideas are not new. So the way Mm -hmm. to go about it, in my opinion, is to work with the people who know what they're doing and have done it before. So to, Mm -hmm. to, to, to network with the biggest soft toy companies is exactly what I did. You know, I got the name known. I, I said, you know, here's what we're doing. What do you think? And you generally get, we, I've generally had a very good response. And then you start being able to network with them opens the network even further because they introduce you to other people and they're like, oh, we were interested in doing this license, but it's not something we did. Are you interested in it? Would you like to do a joint venture? So all these opportunities come. So my biggest piece of advice is don't think you are doing yourself an injustice by opening up your ideas to other existing companies and firms that they'll steal your ideas and things like that contact them reach out to them try and speak to the to the founders you know you want to you want to make sure that you're uh, in the best possible scenario to have the full facts about the industry that you're going into because some people say no i'm going to keep this a secret i'm going to go it alone i'm going to try my mm. best you know but that that in my opinion that's that's not uh, an excellent way. I'm sure there's some examples where you want to keep stuff close to your chest, but mm-hmm. on, a, on, a, on a general scale, I think it's very, very invaluable to get that. It's, it, I'm not going to say mentorship because that's not what I mean, but I'm, I'm, yeah. trying, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is to don't hide away in the corner and try and build something. Network with the people who have done it before uh, and, and, and just, even if it's not the owners, you know, people who have been involved with the processes just to get your name known, and by no means is it a fast process. So mm-hmm. make sure that you are you are focused on what you're doing, but also don't hide away in the corner of your in your in your office or wherever you're working or in your in your in your apartment. Make sure you get out there and speak to these people, and and they may not reply to you, but if you keep going, they will reply to you, and then you're going to be one step ahead of everyone else because everyone else was scared to speak to them. So biggest piece of advice. So would you say that even when you, when you try to step into an industry where other competitors are already working, would you think that people, I, I, I don't want to say help you, but are people willing to share their knowledge, although they see that you most likely will end up being a competitor to themselves? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I know uh, your listeners, a lot of your listeners will not be uh, in, in, all in my age bracket but I have to say that the younger that I got started it felt like the more that the experienced people were willing to help me because they kind of see me as like a business son like a mm-hmm. son business son and they want to help and see you know they've had fulfillment from their businesses they want to see other people succeed if they're if they're good business people 
and they are caring for others, they will always spend their time being there to help and mentor others. It's, it's not even about money for them. They just want to see results and success. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So wrapping this all up, uh, of course, now some people will think I have great advice out of that. So thank you very much. Of course, they might think, what are the typical mistakes? Like what were your top three tips of what to avoid the typical top three mistakes people make? Just three pieces of advice to wrap this all up where you, where you tell people, maybe you think it's a good idea, but it's not because. What were your top three tips in that direction? Um, so I think the first thing is uh, to spend as little money as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people are happy to splash the cash on a concept that they don't know will work, whether it will work or not. So really keep your cost to a minimum. There are always ways of being resourceful. Mm -hmm. um, another tip is to uh, really study your market. You know, don't go into something that you think. Using the word you think this is a good idea or you think that might work, it's about knowing. Mm -hmm. speak, speak to people, speak to retailers, speak to uh, people who you're going to be providing your service for. Uh, get the feedback. Don't be afraid to mm -hmm. ask. Um, okay. I, I didn't do that at the beginning. And uh, had I have done that, I think I would have uh, been a little bit further along because I might have, you know, you can consider yourself wasting a little bit of time on products where you could have had immediate feedback from a retailer yeah, or, or whoever you're providing a service for. Um, and my third advice is make sure, make sure what you're doing is, is enjoyable because it can very often... Uh, become tiring and you can feel burnt out and, and not interested in working on your project. So m make sure it does interest you uh, and, and take the time to separate yourself from whether, whether you're going to make a lot of money from it or not, because it, it gets very boring very quickly. Excellent. That is very valuable advice. I think many of our listeners are in the situation where they either now think about starting a business or they may be in a business where they say, where is this going? Where shall I go? And what are pitfalls I could mistake, I, I could avoid right now? So um, thank you very much for your valuable time. And of course, I'm going to put your contact details into the show notes. So when people want to get in contact with you, they can get in contact with you directly. And Joel, now I only have to say one thing at the very end, which I always say, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome, Mills. Thank you for having me.